I had um, a student about eight years ago. She already had a master's degree before she came to Monterey. She got another master's degree. Um, I mean, just, just brilliant. She spent 25 years in the medical, um, medical profession doing project management at major hospitals, things like that. She was in her 50s. And her first job, she was earning 32000 a year. And her classmates said, you're crazy. That's horrible. That's shameful. I can't believe you're talking about it. She said, ah, but wait. She goes, I'm moving to Liberia. And people went, oh, wait a second. She said, I have a four-bedroom house waiting for me for free. Um, I have a driver because of security issues in Liberia at the time. I have uh, a full-time housekeeper, a full-time gardener. Um, they're going to ship my 200-plus pound dogs. My husband's in another country. They're going to ship him to Liberia. They <laughs> <laughs> eventually shipped him back. That didn't work out. But, um, <laughs> which they helped with financially. You don't love this particular organization. Um, she was an absolute computer fiend. So they spent, this was in the late 90s, they spent thousands of dollars in a computer system for her. This was before the cell phone system really worked just about everywhere in the world. They got her satellite phone at two grand a year. Um, they shipped over, I can't remember how many thousands of pounds of personal family equipment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they said mm -hmm. that it's a challenging environment to live in, so every three months we want you to get outside of Liberia. Every six months we're going to send you to Europe for a week, and once a year you're going to go back to the U.S. for a couple weeks, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up right now, I'm leaving Monterey. So, but she had to live in a very challenging environment. She was arrested there several times. She had numerous security issues. She had numerous health issues that were involved. I mean, it was a difficult position. Her salary was actually uh, in the high 80s or 90s, tax-free, um, because of where she was working, the cost of living adjustments and the hardship adjustments. So, you know, when I often used to talk about my students about salary, don't, don't quibble about necessarily the dollar value. Find out what everything else is going to be built around it, because the dollar value is just a dollar value. You can't get taxed on your free house, your garden, or your, you know, shipping of two dogs, the surfboards, whatever's important to you, you know, the private schools for your kids in whatever location in the world. You don't get taxed on that. So this is all take-home money. And as she said, she paid off, you know, a very expensive private school education in two years. Because she said, I've got nothing to buy but some groceries, and what else am I going to spend money on? So think about that. That is one of the benefits sometimes, depending on the organization you're with. This is not the case for a lot of international organizations. This is more the private sector. So what is the stuff that you've got to do or to think about now? If you want a career that's internationally focused in the private sector, these are some areas to consider. These are generic skill sets, but it's really going to allow you to have a better understanding. What companies are out there that do the work you're interested in? Why are you selling a product you don't believe? Why are you promoting or working for an organization you don't believe in? If you are anti-smoking, you probably shouldn't be working for, you know, Philip Morris. I mean, this is not going to work for you ethically. Think about these things. Um, let's be very realistic. It's not that you can, you don't have to have a business degree to work in the private sector, but it's certainly going to help if you've got business experience or the coursework that could be relevant, or the writing skills, or the financial skills, or the marketing skills. I mean, know your audience's needs. Trying to sell yourself as, I'm trying to think of extremes. Hi, I've been a nurse for seven years, and now I want to be a market analyst in you know, I don't know, in the clothing industry, the first thing someone's going to say is, huh, how, how, how can you do this? What, what do you know that allows you to do that kind of work? So know what the needs are of these different interest areas and polish and practice your skills of that. Um, as I said before, there's going to be a reality. If this organization always likes to send all of their employees at some point to live in exotic location A, Again, they don't go there the first day they're working there. They have to put in their dues. We have a lot of our, um, China, or our Japanese translation interpretation students. They get phenomenal jobs with Toyota. They have to go live in a very, very small town in Ohio. This is not necessarily the glamorous location that a lot of our graduates thought they were going to be going to. It's a great job. It's a fabulous salary, great, you know, great opportunities for them. They love the work, but they're living in a, let me emphasize this again, a really small town in Ohio. But this is an international career for them. They are not U.S. citizens. They're living in the United States. They're working in an international company. They're working with international dignitaries and delegates and visitors constantly. They're having to give and take on some of those experiences. Okay. Different accenture. There you go. Um, just different types of positions. And again, if you look at the titles for a lot of people, what does a global supply chain manager do? Well, they track the stuff as it goes from one location to another. And how much stuff do we have to get from one location to another? And how quickly? And what issues in weather and shipping and receiving and, I don't know, wars are going to you know, impact getting the stuff there. That's the supply chain system. You know, strategic consultants. Everybody that graduates as an undergrad without a business degree that wants to become a consultant immediately, it's not that you're not going to do it. You probably will. 
It just may not happen the day you graduate when you're 22 and you haven't done anything yet. Again, there's always exceptions to that. There's always people that go off and do that kind of work. But chances are they had a very specific type of education or other types of relevant skills that got them into that field early on. Usually, you need to know something and have done it before before you start to tell other people how to do it. That's what a consultant does in general. Policy work. Every single thing you've done today, every decision you've made, um, why you're wearing something you're wearing, the food you ate, the decisions to come to this campus, the transportation system you used to get to the campus, I don't know, the books you were reading today, in some way, shape, or form, had something to do with policy. So for people that say, I don't ever deal with policy, garbage, you do, you just don't know it. Or you're not actually the people that make the policy, or advocate for the policy, or implement the policy, or address the policy, or protest against the policies. But in general, you'll find policy in all three sectors, public, private, and nonprofit. Most people think of policy work as in the governmental fields. That certainly is the obvious area. But most nonprofit organizations are either benefiting from policies that have been made, they're actually implementing them into a community. Or if they're in the private sector, they're working within the structures or sometimes constraints of different policies, and they're advocating for change within those policies. Um, nonprofits also benefit from the finance side of policy. They're seeking funding, they receive the funding, and again, they, they, they do that work for the benefit of another community. So again, this could be a different area for you as it relates to some sort of international career. So what do you do? Um, research centers, think tanks, that's an obvious one. Um, most topics, most issues, we had a guy that went to our school years ago, he was obsessed about pears, just pears, everything to do with pears. Hi, pears. He ended up working for the Pear Association as a trade analyst. And what he did was look at pear issues, again, this is his thing, not clearly yours and mine, looking at global pear concerns and shipping pears and how to get pears into the marketplace in Russia and in Benin and in Botswana and in, I don't know, Mozambique or Bolivia, wherever. I mean, that was his role, was looking at pear issues. Now, I highly doubt anybody in the room is a pear policy person. <laughs> and if you are, I've got a great contact for you because this guy knows everything about pears. But he ended up moving on to a think tank that, again, dealt with fruit. <laughs> this was his thing. you got to give him credit. But what they were looking at was the policy issues. What impact do different trade embargoes have? Again, what, what issues are involved with weather and production, manufacturing? Can pears be produced in... Bangladesh for a cheaper price, which is going to have a massive impact on the U.S. pear industry, and then what will happen to pear growers here? And if there's a problem with pear growers, what happens to, you know, some of the um, the individuals that are coming in from Mexico and the Caribbean to work actually in the fields? What how, what economic impact is that going to have on those countries when money is not being sent back to families because of the the you know the workers in the fields that are actually picking the pears? So I mean, it, it's more than we think of every time you pick up a piece of fruit. Who Backstoppers are the major area. Um, for people that are interested in an international career and you find yourself domestically based, you're often referred to as providing backstop support. Backstop means you're the back person behind. I don't know what stopping comes in. Um, maybe because it stops at your desk, I don't know. But you're the person that's providing the logistics, the resources, the support, the finance, the management, all those topic areas I mentioned earlier to the people that are the field offices or the field assignments. You likely do end up at some point going to some of those field offices but if you're representing the South American desk for Catholic Relief Services in Baltimore, you know, you're a backstopper or a support liaison person for the Andean region, and you're specifically looking at gender empowerment issues. So you deal with those policy issues, those funding programs for the three or four countries that make up that region, and you're providing support and resources and networks and services to the to the main headquarters, to the main regional staff. Okay. So if you're sitting here today and you're going, okay, well, this, you know, other than the pair work, it all sounds kind of interesting to me. What is it I can do now? How many of you actually have degrees in international relations or policy or international affairs or international development? Handful of you, okay. It's not that you have to go off to school tomorrow and get an education in these areas. It can help. Let's be realistic, but it's not necessarily what you have to do. And as you were saying before, you know, how do I, how do I make sure I even this is something I want to do before I maybe invest in going back to school or decide that this is the type of career I want to get engaged with? Think about local organizations right now. Um, how many of you have ever, 